So, good evening. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm Tim O'Shea, uh, Principal and, and Vice-Chancellor of the University. Um, it's a really a tremendous pleasure uh, to welcome you uh, to Professor Harold Hass's inaugural lecture. I'm particularly delighted um, that we have in the audience his wife, uh, Sibylla, and his four-week-old uh, baby, Anna. Um, but also uh, delighted to see senior members of court, uh, members of the Board of Scottish Enterprise, and lots and lots of students, and obviously lots, lots of academic colleagues. So you're all, all very welcome here. Um, lots of excitement uh, about um, the work that Professor Haas uh, has been doing, and like you, I, I'm, I'm really um, uh, thrilled to be here. Um, he and I share a little bit of sort of evolution. He, I was asking him, as I always do when to people who have gotten massively successful, you know, when did you really start? He built his first hobby radio when he was 14. And I, and I, was, uh, I was building Wii radios about the same age too. Right? And for those of you, I'm looking to see, if, I'm not sure if there's anybody apart from Sevilla who's under, who is for, under 14. But if you were, if you were under 14, if, if you, but no, no, if you haven't built a radio yet, build a radio. No, it's, it is, seriously, it's a life enhancing thing to do. Um, so then um, Harold at the University of Nuremberg uh, became diploma engineer and really de developed the academic side of his uh, wireless interest. He got his doctorate from here in 2000, University of Edinburgh in 2001. From two th for a year, to, to the beginning of two, 2001 to 2002, he was project manager at uh, Siemens uh, for information and communication mobile networks. Uh, he then joined the, uh, what's now the Jacobs University of Bremen, uh, and he was there for five years as Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering. And then really very happily uh, for us and happily for his research, uh, he returned to the University of Edinburgh in 2007. Um, he holds 18 patents. He's uh, published uh, more than 40 journal articles, including a science article which has been cited more than 400 times, 130 peer-reviewed conference papers. And for those of you who aren't familiar, with these sorts of domains in a, in a very fast moving area like Harold's, an awful lot of the important publications are done as conference preprints rather than as uh, journals. He's uh, co authored a book entitled Next Generation Mobile Access Technologies with Cambridge University Press, uh, which has been translated into uh, Chinese. Um, he got a lot of prominence uh, when the TED Global Conference happily came to, to Edinburgh earlier in the year. Um, and since 2007, uh, he's been a regular high-level visiting scientist supported uh, by the Chinese uh, 111 program, um, in his case, at the uh, Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. And for th those of you who don't know, this is a very important uh, program, um, similar to the Excellence Initiative in Germany, where a small number of um, hi highly important areas are supported. So I'm really very pleased he's here to give us the inaugural for his uh, personal chair in mobile communications, uh, which is entitled Shedding Light on Future Wireless Communications. Please welcome Howard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Shea for the introduction and for your kindly hosting this event today. I am deeply honored to be able to stand here today and I would like to take the opportunity uh, to say a few words of thanks um, because it's not an event that, you, that doesn't happen every, time, every, every day. Particularly, I'd like, to, like uh, to thank my wife, Sibylle, who has been patiently waiting for time to be invented and to be wrapped into a past and to be given to her. Not yet there, but we're working towards that uh, direction. Furthermore, thanks are due to uh, Peter Grant. Uh, Peter Grant is the former head of school whose uh, encouragement, guidance has been of incredible value. And simply speaking, Peter is, a, is an incredible uh, mentor and um, colleague. Also, I'd like to thank the, the current head of school, Alan Murray, for his tremendous support, as well as uh, the current uh, head of institute, uh, Bernie Mulgrew, who accepted the innovation from Bremen in 2007 in uh, giving us a home, me and my, my research team, in IDCOM, and we, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, at the moment. And um, 
I'd also like to thank uh, Nicola, our secretary, who's uh, basically made, through his tire tireless uh, work, made these events like this happen. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank my research team um, and uh, my research sponsors for enabling me to pursue new research avenue in wireless and mobile communications. So hopefully I haven't forgotten anyone, but apologies uh, if that is the case. I, I now would like to go through this uh, presentation and um, it's about wireless communications, mobile communications. And in the past, mobile communications looked like that, maybe, uh, um, moving a few uh, telephone boxes. But uh, it's uh, this person, um, maybe, uh, sorry, uh, at the moment, this was the past, the future looks like this, that we have about 1.4 million cellular radio base station or radio masts deployed worldwide. And we have more than 5 billion smartphones or mobile phones in use at the moment. And we noticed that the end of October was the time when the United Nations officially said we have more than 5 billion people on, on, on this planet. So basically everyone, almost everyone on average, has a mobile phone. And this is an increasing trend that people use mobile communications more intensively. And um, it's, it's, an, it's a utility like now electricity and water. It's, we use it, we use it in our everyday lives, we use it in our professional lives, and it even impacts political systems as we have uh, recently seen. So it's, it's, it's such a, so important, but if we look at it, how old it is, it's basically younger than I am. It's, it's by, invented by a person, Cooper, from Motorola, and this is the patent which describes the first radio telephone system in 73. Uh, um, so we have seen a tremendous growth in that technology. And this growth is um, basically shown in that, in that slide here, which uh, shows from the year 2010 to the forecast in 2015, the number of bytes transmitted per month through our wireless systems. And you need to note the y-axis, it's called exa, exabyte. Exa is a one in 18 zeros. It's a really, really, really large number. And um, you notice at the moment we have 0.6 exabytes, but the forecast is that basically is increased by factor 10 in 2015. So we need to note that a tremendous growth in, in data traffic that goes through these networks. And here you don't have to read the, 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 uh, the axis, nothing to read here. This is the radio frequency spectrum occupation in the United States from zero to 300 gigahertz. You just have to note that basically it's, it's a patchy landscape here. So basically every little piece of radio frequency spectrum, which is the means to do wireless communications, is already in use in some form or the other. It's really hard to identify new radio frequency spectrum for wireless communications or for communication systems at all, let alone wireless communications. So we need to remember there's little and additional frequency resources we can gain. We have a tremendous growth in the number of smartphones and telephones that we see in the next few years. The data traffic increases. And what is plotted here, a slightly more complicated graph, is we plot, uh, it's plotted here, the, the network capacity per device. Basically, if we take the, the, the radio communications infrastructure and basically divide by the number of devices, this would give us the, 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 the capacity that would, could be carried by, uh, per device at the moment. And then we see the blue curve, which is the forecast traffic that is needed to supply all this required data that these millions and billions uh, of wireless devices would demand. And you see a clear trend. They don't go in the di same direction. We need more traffic, more capacity than, than we have, and tremendously more. If you take the number, this is roughly about 40 uh, megabytes per month per device. And what we actually need in 2014 is 1,700 uh, 1, megabytes per device. And there's a gap, it's, it's a clear shortfall. Uh, we, 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 running, we are running out of spectrum. So this um, poses very interesting questions to me. First of all, 
are we using the existing radio frequency spectrum most efficiently for wireless communications? If we can answer that question, then we, we have a clue if it's a dead end or something can be done to, to make um, available new resources. But before we can answer that question, we need to answer, do we know what most efficiently is? And um, I humbly say I, don't, I would answer both questions with no. The reason why that is, I, I can show you here with a simple uh, example. In wireless communications, we have a wireless transmitter. It's shown on the left-hand side here. It has a certain power it uses. And there's a receiver at some end, at the other end, and in between is a, a channel, a wireless channel. And that provides a gain, but the gain is less than one, so it essentially is a loss. And there's um, a person that really helped us, who invented uh, information theory. Information theory, it's Claude E. Shannon. He developed uh, a framework that helps us describe and relate capacity, this is data rate, bytes, bits per second, with bandwidth, the radio frequency spectrum, the, the, the power that we use to transmit, PTX, and, and noise. And um, this is shown here. So this is the capacity, the number of bits we transmit or we can get from a certain bandwidth, a range of frequencies, from a certain transmit power at the, the base station, per, perhaps, and some gain between the base station and your mobile handset, which is less than one, and some noise power. So we can either increase the transmit power, we can increase the bandwidth, we can decrease the noise. These are the screws we can use in order to enhance the, the data rate per device. That's fine, that is limited, this is given. So we could answer, yes, we know how much data rate we would get. We just have to plug the numbers into this equation. But life isn't that simple in wireless communications because typically you have many links transmitting instantaneously. And we want to reuse the same frequency band res resources we have, this frequency CB, many times. And now we have suddenly the, the numerator here in that equation that gives us the, that link here, but suddenly something appears in the denominator of that equation. And you, simple mathematics, if something appears in a denominator, it makes the whole thing smaller. And basically, this whole thing there at the bottom in red is interference. It's interference. It's radiated power from one device that basically um, comes to the receiver at the other end. And this diminishes, the, diminishes the, the capacity. So the fundamental question now is we can basically eliminate that interference by splitting that bandwidth B into two halves and give one half of the bandwidth to one link and another half to the other link. Then we wouldn't have interference. Or we could transmit simultaneously using the same bandwidth, but accept interference. The question is, what is better? And again, I pose the question here, is it better to give each link half the bandwidth, so half that B, um, and have no interference? Or do we allow every link or each link to transmit on the whole bandwidth, but allow interference? Uh, and um, the answer is, is uh, here on that plot, which, um, again, is a, might be a bit involved, but you see a plane that uh, sticks out of a red plane. The red plane is uh, sort of the, the reference plane where both, both scenarios would be equivalent. But sometimes, we are better off transmitting simultaneously on both links on the same bandwidth, and sometimes you are better halving the bandwidth and give uh, each of them half and have no interference. But it depends on the deployment scenario. So it depends on the scenario on these links between the transmitter and the receiver and, uh, and the interference uh, transmitter and receiver. And we want to have a system that basically autonomously uh, would find the best situation when it uses the resources in what, what manner. But that isn't, isn't easy. Therefore, people have come up with a very, or basically a person called uh, um, Vern McDonald in, in the Bell Labs uh, came up with this concept that's called frequency reuse. You take that frequency B and divide it into N chunks, or three chunks, for example, three subbands, B1, B2, and P3, and allocate only one-third of the bandwidth to one cell, 
And you see the, that's what different colors. This is a cell. This is a base station where in the middle you typically have a radio mast, the, the antennas, and it covers a certain area. And typically this is a circle, but a circle would be, wouldn't be would allow to cover entire area. That's why we approximate by hexagons. So we have one third of the bandwidth in B1, B2, and B3. And what we can do is in order to have a reuse of the same frequencies, we repeat that pattern as often as we wish, as we wish. If you look like this, and suddenly what happens, there's no red cell adjacent to another red cell, no green cell adjacent to another green cell. There's always a ring of other, cell, other colored cells in between, and that provides a static interference protection. So we don't have that problem that two links are very close to each other and interfere with each other. At the expense of shown here in that red circle, assume this is an area of one square kilometer. Within one square kilometer, you use that frequency B2, that subband, only once. You can't use it there, you don't use it there, there, there. So we use that frequency less efficiently. But we provide it sort of protection against interference. The problem is now if, if a smartphone, uh, an iPhone, uses this entire band, subband B1 completely, then no one else in that area, in that circled area, can use it again. So what's the way out of this dilemma? How can we get it more efficiently? And the, 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 the answer to that is to make the cells smaller. Take the same principle. Again, there's a red cell, and it's only surrounded by a green and a blue cell. There's interference protection. Take the same area, and now you see that many red cells are within that area. So we can reuse that subband B2 many, many times. And therefore, we enhance the efficiency, so the efficient use of that subband B2. My daughter disagrees, but uh, <laughs> um, it's okay. So this is, this is static frequency reuse. Um, what we ideally wish to have is we don't split the frequencies into subbands. We want to reuse the same frequency in every cell so that we are not forced to shrink the cells, which has, comes at the advantage that we have to have many base stations, many cellular radio masks, many antennas deployed everywhere, and basically uh, it's financially not manageable. Therefore, what we do is this, uh, um, apply the same bandwidth in all cells, and then even have different levels of cells, different cell sizes. We call it macro cell, we call this micro cell, and sometimes even we cover with one base station an entire home. They, these cells are called femtocells. So we have a a hierarchy of cells, and we use the same frequency, but we have an enormous problem now with interference. And we get, so here is an example. Here's a, this is an outdoor, a macro cell, and we have in street canyons, we might have these cells. In indoor buildings, we might have these cells, and we have, might even have smaller cells than these ones in different environments. So the problem is interference, and we need to get smart methods in place where the systems autonomously, independently find out whether they can use a certain resource or they can't. And we've been working in that area for quite a number of years with a, a big Japanese operator and have developed a self-organizing technique which we call the busy burst technique. And the, the way it works is, is demonstrated here very quickly. We have a base station that wants to transmit to that mobile station, so it transmits, so no problem, no interference. The link is fine and everything is okay. The problem occurs if that base station wants to transmit to that mobile station here. That transmission from here to here, there's only a little difference between these two would cause high interference at B. So what we do um, in order to prevent that case is that we let that mobile station transmit a little signal. Um, like, hello. And this is transmitted at a certain power, and that power can be measured all around that mobile station B, and it creates a so-called exclusion region. Now, before that base station starts transmitting, what it would do is it would just listen to that power it receives from that mobile station, and if that power is a buffer threshold, which would, would, would mean in turn that interference would be high if it would transmit. So it could then decide not to transmit, and protect that link here. 
This is like, like a, a cocktail party. You go to a cocktail party, you talk to your neighbor, and suddenly somebody comes in very close to you and starts shouting. All communication is broken. But, my, uh, but if you had a protocol that you, as a recipient of information, would at very given specified times say something, like A, and that is then uh, received by your potential interferer, and there's a policy of politeness in place that tells you if you receive that A at a certain level, you don't speak, because it would mean in turn you would interfere with an ongoing conversation. And then the, the ongoing conversation could go on, and you could basically use your smartphone to communicate with your partner, because that would essentially mean you would use a different channel, but still would be able to communicate, but not using your, your voice. And that's, that's the principle how it would work. So it's, it's a self-organizing, polite structure so that all links in, in a network are protected, but we reuse if we can, or when we can. And that, in that case, for example, that, that base station is inside that exclusion region. It wouldn't transmit. It would refrain from transmission. So this one can go on transmitting. But let's assume that base station would have been outside that exclusion region. That would have meant, okay, if I'm transmitting, I would generate only little interference, so I can go on and reuse the same frequency and therefore enhance the spectral efficiency. And that, that is how it works. And here, what I've plotted here uh, is the throughput, so that the data rate you can, uh, mobile would achieve on average. And here is probability. Uh, say this is 10%. And here is sort of the benchmark, the old scheme. And here the black curves are the new scheme. And um, it only, basically, only thing you need to know from this graph is that if that line here crosses the 10% the or 0 0.1 line, that means that um, on, on average, sorry, you have uh, the data rate that is guaranteed would be, in that case, probably 800 kilobit per second. So 90% of users would be able to get a data rate higher than um, 800 um, kilobit per second. But if we go to the black curve here, and again use the percentile here, with our scheme, um, it would be possible that a user would get more, 90% uh, of users would get more than 5.5 megabit per second. So if you're in a hotel room or somewhere else, and if you get 800 kilobits per second, and you compare 5.5 megabit, I think it makes a difference in, in, your, in the service and, and the phones you're, you're using. So we have clearly um, developed a technique that allows self-organized interference management in such, such networks. This, we, can, we can now, we have applied that, that scheme of reuse on a cellular level, but we can also apply it on a link level. Let's assume you have a transmitter here and uh, one antenna and one transmitter, and this is the, 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 the capacity, the number of bits per second we get um, for that link. Let's assume you have multiple antennas at the transmitter, <coughs> and you have multiple antennas at the receiver, and we call that a MIMO scheme. Multiple input, multiple output. And we have a channel, and let's assume there's propagation through the channel, and there's effects like reflection, dispersion, so signals bounce backwards and forwards, and this produces a certain condition. Under certain conditions of that channel here, we can get higher capacity, and it basically increases linearly with the number of transmit and receive antennas, the minimum of which. So if you have four transmit antennas and four receive antennas, you can increase the capacity by a number, by basically four, four, four times. And this is uh, plotted here in, in that graph where we plot the capacity, which is the, the, the data rate, the bits per second that you can get using the one antenna and the, 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 the transmitter and one antenna at the receiver. And you see at a certain so-called signal-to-noise ratio, you don't have to, to worry about the the details here on the axis, the x axis. So, but if we now introduce these MIMO schemes, we see that suddenly these graphs get higher and higher and they got, get significantly higher. That means we can get significantly higher capacity on that link. 
The problem that we generate via this scheme is, is shown here. First of all, how it works could be illustrated by pipes. We generate multiple pipes between a transmit antenna and a receive antenna. And we transmit data through these pipes. But the pipes are not ideal pipes. There's leakage. There's leakage from one pipe to another pipe. There's leakage from one pipe to the third pipe, from that pipe to the other pipe, and basically applies to all of the antennas. Again, we come down to the concept of we reuse, but we, 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 we buy interference. So we get a little bit of that signal from that pipe into here, and that causes interference, and um, we have to deal with that. And the way we deal with it is via signal processing. And here is uh, what happens in a different uh, illustration. So this is the first pipe that wants to transmit a symbol A, and it gets the A, but it gets also a little bit of B, a little bit of C, and a bit more of D from the other three pipes. We have the second pipe, which gets B, but a little bit of all the others. And this little bit of all the others is interference. So we have now smart algorithms that identify which symbol is the largest compared to all the interference signal. And let's assume we have smart signal processing algorithms that would be able to detect that A. This is the smart, this is the beauty of digital communications. Let's assume we can detect that A, which would give us a very unique advantage. We could then subtract that A from all the other links here. So interference would get less on the other, in the other pipes. But first, we would detect the strongest symbol and subtract from all others. So what would happen, we would have A, a clean A, and we would have a cleaner B, a cleaner C, and a cleaner D. Notice here, it's really hard to distinguish between D, C, and B. Yeah, it's relatively high B and C. Um, but now we can see C is very strong here. Maybe we can detect C on the third stream mathematically. Let's do that. And we can subtract C there and there. And suddenly, the, the, the second and the fourth pipe that would get cleaner. Now, there's only one interference term we have to deal with in the second pipe. So we can detect B here, subtract from the others, and we have all symbols recovered at the receiver. That's why we, now we transmit in one go four symbols, A, B, C, D, instead of only one. So we have increased the capacity fourfold with at the expense of some signal processing. Um, the, the problem here is that we have inter-simple interference, the inter-channel interference that requires high computational power, and that basically drains the battery, and that causes all sorts of other problems. We need to synchronize the antennas, we need to have multiple RF chains, multiple transmitters, multiple receivers, and if we don't properly detect one stream and subtract a incomplete uh, symbol from the other stream, we have error propagation. So again, we've been thinking about that and uh, thought, how can we solve that problem? The main problem to solve here is how can we get rid of interference? And the way we got rid of interference is via a scheme called spatial modulation, which we've introduced and now hope, happily see that it's worldwide accepted and other places uh, basically built on the concept we have developed there. Again, we have our multiple transmitters here what we do is we split. So we want to transmit here our A, B, C, D, but we say that each antenna is also linked to a symbol A, B, C, D, a blue symbol and a red symbol. Now what we can do is we can transmit in one go a red symbol and a blue symbol by saying if that antenna transmits, that inherently means that a C is to be transmitted. I can show you how it would work. Let's assume that this is the, the symbols we want to transmit, and it would change between a blue and a red symbol, and that these two symbols are transmitted at one go, in what time instance. And it would, in that first case, in the first time instance, mean that we would transmit from the third antenna, because that is C, from the third antenna, we would transmit a red B. Yeah, that, that point here is a B in that constellation here. In the second time instance, at the second time instance, we would transmit from the fourth antenna, and we would transmit a symbol A, which is that point here, and so on, 
you notice that any, every individual time instance, we only transmit from one antenna, but we transmit two symbols at one time. So we have doubled the capacity, but have fully avoided interference. Um, and that translates into a gain in the number of computations. These are subtractions, multiplications, divisions in a, in a computer. And this is the classical old technique, and this is our technique, and we reduce it by a factor six. So imagine you have a, have a phone that now um, would be, have a battery that lasts six times longer. That's the effect. We have less computations. Not only that, if we compare the, the transmit power, which is the blue one, transmit power of the, the blue one is the, the first scheme I've introduced, and the red one is our scheme, we can reduce the power by, by a factor four, by two one-fourth. So we have less computations, less required transmit power because we have better signal-to-noise ratio, we don't have interference. And that translates to significant uh, battery lifetime in your smartphone if you apply that. At the while you can still enjoy large data rates. So if you compare complexity, data rate, obviously the classical MIMO schema I've explained first has high complexity but also high data rate. Then there's the single antenna, single uh, antenna at the receiver and transmitter has low complexity but also low data rate. And we have low complexity and high data rate sits somewhere in the middle, but a practical solution which we are now trying to pursue in, in a project in China, UK China Bridge Project, where we try to commercialize that technology. So the, the key question is now, we've introduced techniques, uh, and you, you notice it all boils around reducing interference, regardless how you view wireless communications. The question now is, is, is MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, be enough? And smart interference management, these two together, would they solve our problem of exponentially growing data rates per month? Um, I say no. And here's some evidence um, uh, I'd like to, to share with you. This is the spectral efficiency gain that we achieve using different systems. Uh, these are practical systems we are here at the moment. Um, that, that is the, the current uh, system we have. In the future, we have this system and this system. This two by two means two transmitter antennas and two receiver antennas. And uh, this is the efficiency in number of bits we transmit per second per sort of frequency unit, per hertz frequency. And you see a trend, it's saturating. So uh, smart research is reflected in these systems here. This is, these are practical systems. So we see that smart research doesn't get these, uh, these curves exponentially higher, it saturates. So we only can use the existing radio frequency spectrum to a certain extent efficient. We can't grow the efficiency, the efficient use of radio spectrum outside what we have at the moment and uh, probably we, we end up with 1.5 or something. But we would need, if you remember, from 0.6 exabytes to six exabytes, we need a tenfold increase of the efficiency. And this is really not possible with radio frequency techniques. That's why I've been looking into other ways, and I've been trying to think out of the box, step back, be limited in the RF box. Now let's look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, where we have the radio wave. So this is the, the messy plot I have shown you at the beginning with these patches and so on. This is only one part of the, radio, of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's only also infrared, it's also part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There is visible light. So here, the light that's around us. There is um, ultraviolet light. There are X-rays, gamma rays. Certain frequency bands you won't really touch. Uh, too dangerous. But in the middle sits something of a big value, of a big asset. No one really has looked at it. And I started looking into this uh, eight years ago with the advent of uh, these light-emitting diodes were able, Alec these are electronic devices which produce high light output. And they have other very interesting features. But if you look at the linear frequency range here, we compare the radio wave spectrum with the visible light spectrum, guess what? This is not only free, it's not regulated, it's available everywhere, and it's 10,000 times larger than RF. And it's unused, it's only used for 
dumb illumination. We might need to make more out of it. And this is, this is what we've been doing the last uh, two years, funded by Scottish Enterprise. We turn this into an asset, not only an illumination, illumination device, into a wireless communications device. And the interesting point is we have spent a lot of money, or operators have spent a lot of money to install this infrastructure. 1.4 million cellular radio masts. But interestingly, sorry, we, we have 14 billion installed light bulbs worldwide, incandescent light bulbs. So the infrastructure is there, here, there, everywhere, light, light bulbs. There's no need to install more infrastructure. Just get rid of this bloody, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> the, the energy-consuming incandescent light bulbs and get more energy-consuming, uh, energy-saving uh, light equipment into these sockets there. And we've done calculations. You can save more than 10 nuclear power stations if you just were replaced incandescent light by energy uh, efficient um, LED light. This is it. This is an LED light bulb. You can go and buy at B and Q and elsewhere. You won't get the best quality, but you get them, and they are they are used. And there are cities like Birmingham who have uh, projects where they replace street lights by LED light because it's more cost efficient. So, what are the drivers for this visible light communication? Is the looming spectrum crisis that also the, the Federal Communications Commission in the United States has issued. The energy efficiency, a base station at the moment, runs at an efficiency of about 5%. Most of the energy is wasted in cooling. Um, security, RF can be intercepted. We know that uh, all the Google uh, cars that picked up all the Wi-Fi's in the streets. The availability, we can't use RF in aircraft cabins or underwater. Um, but we have this uh, tremendous advancement in solid state lighting, and there's cost. If you have many devices, then there's cost. And there's another basically hidden driver that we don't see at the moment, but will be coming. The Internet of Things. There are people that forecast that in the future we will have seven trillion wireless devices spread around. Um, and that means a thousand per person on Earth. And that the driving force behind that is Again, saving energy, saving, saving the globe. The amount of energy, the domestic energy consumption is about 30%. And most of it, if you think, is 10, 12% is for lighting and other purposes. The entire energy, energy consumption of information communication technology is 2%. So if we manage to get our homes, our stores, our universities more energy efficient, um, that that would self save a lot of energy. And in order to do that, we need to get smart environments. We need to have things that communicate with, with, with each other. If you go to the office that your thermostat at the heating recognizes that you're in your office and then turns it on, and if you leave it, it turns it off automatically without human intervention. And that, that is smart environments. And this requires communications. It requires communication devices. And this requires light, in my view. Um, so the Internet of Things is, is another driving force. And there's, there are a few fundamental differences between radio frequency communication using incoherent light. And it's shown here where in radio frequency we use the, the field, the electric field. We use complex values and we only use signals that have negative and positive values. When we use intensity, intensity is power, can never be negative, only therefore unipolar. It can only be real value. You can't transmit a complex number through light. It's impossible. And the, the information is carried in the intensity. And these are fundamental differences which require fundamental research and fundamental breakthroughs in order to make high data rate transmission possible using these devices. And we've been looking in that. This is the old classical way how your remote control at home works. You want to transmit a binary bit stream like this one, and um, you would... Uh, if you want to transmit a logical binary one, you turn it on. The LED, if you want to transmit a zero, you turn it off. That's a transmitter. What you see at the receiver is something like that. It's distorted because of sort of all sorts of distortion, distortions on the way from the transmitter to the receiver. And what you would do, you would introduce a threshold, and you would decide at every instant, is that value above the threshold after you have synchronized, and then you would decide, yes, above, so it's a one, it's a zero, a one, a zero, and that's how you re would regain the, the capacity. 
but you would only, in terms of states, you have two, you have on and off on the real axis. That's all you can get, like the Morse alphabet. And uh, if you remember the very basic equation at the beginning, capacity scales with a signal to noise ratio. So that means the signal power. It doesn't matter if that point is here or here or in the roof or in the sky. As long as it's above the threshold, it's a one. It's only a one. It's only one. So we really can't scale the data rate with the signal power we have. But if we use with the communication, we have lots of signal power, and we want to make use of that. So this isn't working here. Um, so that's why we came up with a smarter technique. Again, I like pipes. Now the pipes are in the frequency domain. We have frequency pipes. And uh, we have now a constellation diagram, which is like the English alphabet, where you not only have on and off, you have A, B, C, D, have a richer alphabet, where one number basically carries four bits in that case. And now we have not only the real axis, only the two yellow points, we have 16. And if we have very good signals, we can have 64. And if we have even better signal, we can have 1,024 of these yet yellow dots uh, split uh, uh, there on the axis per channel. And then if we have a magic operation here, which is not really magic, it's called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which generate, generates from this complex set of numbers a real valued signal that looks like that. It's varying in intensity quite heavily, a problem in RF, because in RF you don't want to have variations in the amplitude. But when I looked at it as a problem in RF, I thought this is a big bonus in, in intensity modulation where we modulate only intensity because these voltage variations, if you want, or courage uh, in, uh, variations can be turned into intensity, intensity of an LED light bulb in, at a speed that is not recognizable by the human eye. And the way we can scale it is sort of shown here. Instead of transmitting one bit, we transmit, in that case, 16, and that, uh, by a standard uh, equation, turns into four bits. So that's why we have these four here. Four times mu, if we have mu frequency pipes, we have 40 times, 40 bits instead of only one bit. We've increased the data, increased the data rate 40 times. And that could be even brought to higher uh, increase if we have very good signal. Now, suddenly we can make use of that gamma here. Suddenly we can scale the data rate with our signal. And that is basically giving us a new, a new dimension, a new, a new possibility in using these light bulbs. In that case, fourfold increase. And we can take this signal here that we get from that magic operation. And um, here we see the input voltage of an LED. And this is the output intensity with different colors. We just impress that signal onto the um, LED curve. And then you see this peak would be high intensity, this peak down would be low intensity. So we vary the intensity of the LED very rapidly. And in the lab, we have now achieved 124 megabits per second in real time in ambient light conditions. I think it's the first, the fastest real time uh, system that uses standard off the shelf LED light bulbs that achieves that data rate. Um, and what does it buy us? It, it would buy us you have a, a, a Wi-Fi router here, wireless LAN, and it gives you 52 megabit per second. And what I've shown you, a light bulb from Fanel, three pounds, gives you twice as much. Not only that, if you think what that is made of, it's made of an RF unit. It's made of a housing and signaling lamps. It requires an AC adapter. It requires cables for you are hooking up the AC adapter, it requires cables. Now, we can throw all this in a bin. We don't require that because a light bulb is supplied by power. We don't need to buy the, the power cord. We don't need the uh, DSL connection. We can get rid of this. Develop a microchip, again, with my colleague in informatics, Nigel Tom and Björn Franke, with an EPSRC project. We try, try to develop such a microchip that is then simply fit into a light bulb, and there, here you are, there you are. 120, 200 megabits per second, and my research goal is one gigabit in uh, 12 months. 
And that's it. So we have done research with the Airbus in, uh, in Germany and have uh, then calculated the signal, this gamma that I've shown you in the equation. This is now shown here in, in graphically. There's a light bulb here, and that's basically high signal, low signal at a corner, even lower signal, low signal there. So we want it to generate maps of data rate. How much bits per second can we transmit at what location in an aircraft A-380 A cabin? That was the question, and here's the answer. We, if we distribute wireless access, optical access points in an aircraft cabin, then we can now fully determine what's the data rate at what point in the, in the cabin. And we have different ways of doing it and different colors show you that there are trade-offs. I'm not going into detail here. But it gives me, to, it gives me now basically the pleasure to, to, to introduce you, to you the potential applications that might bear this technology. It can be used in aircraft cabins, obviously, <laughs> and not only to provide multimedia access and uh, wireless access, cellular access in an aircraft cabin, but also what aircraft manufacturers are interested in is um, reducing the weight. Every wireless system reduces cables, and reduces weight, and makes cabins more flexible. It can be used underwater. Now divers can communicate, ex exchange images. RF doesn't work underwater. Ultrasound is too slow, but here we can achieve megabit per second underwater. Petrochemical plants, not possible to transmit wireless there because of sparks and, and so on. In hospitals, making um, better, more convenient wireless equipment, reduce that to hospitals. That's another. And to manage the high volume of data that is uh, generated in a hospital, to, to um, playing the, like the security card here because, again, these signals, they don't penetrate through walls. It's more secure than in RF. And in the traffic, traffic management, intelligent traffic management systems to avoid, again, energy consumption. If uh, the light here is red, you can turn off the, mo the engine via the light. Or you could use the, the, the front light of a car and the back light that they communicate, cars can communicate with each other, thereby preventing accidents much faster in reaction time, such a system than any human is. Or we can have uh, these uh, shopping lights where um, shop owners can broadcast the latest uh, um, thing on sale via the, the, the window light. Uh, museums that use light to illuminate an object can not only illuminate the object, provide information about the object via this technology. So the, the applications are beyond my imagination at the moment. And I, I, I feel that there is something radical there that we can use. Street lights could be wireless access points. Remember, the way of increasing capacity is getting smaller cell sizes. Here you are, small cell sizes. Every, ra radio, every lamp is a small, radio trans or a, a small wireless transmitter providing hundreds of megabits wireless access. So this is all. I'm, I'm glad I, see, don't, I don't see too many sleeping faces. This is the end of my boring try, uh, theoretical and uh, slide presentation. What I'd like to show you now, hopefully, something that we've developed in the lab, it's a trop here. So what we have here <coughs> is a desk lamp. And inside that desk lamp is an LED light bulb. And behind there is a tiny equipment, not really, it's big power supplies and, and an evaluation board, an FPGA board, which has all these uh, smart, uh, hopefully smart, algorithms implemented. And if, if I turn on the light bulb, you hopefully see that I have light to create my next exam paper. But not only that, uh, it's, it's a high definition, definition video that is transmitted through that light here, through that LED light bulb. And uh, you see, if you look at the light, it doesn't change. You don't see it flickering. You, the changes of the intensity are so rapid, it is normal light. And the question is, do we have, it, have to have the light on all the time? No. Thank you. No, we, we don't. We can dim down the light and then still transmit wireless signals. Because if you remember this, this time variation signal, depending on where you place it in the LED transfer characteristic, 
uh, it would determine how bright that light is. And if you want to have low light, you would basically turn, put it down at the bottom level as much as possible. But I, I can show you that it works as if I do that, there's no video transmitted. So it, it really um, goes through, through the light. And if I release it, get it back, it's a video that has gone through that light. And that's a three pound Farnell LED light bulb. Every student can buy it, have a little project tonight and develop that at home <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs> I, I, I collect the papers. Um, the, the, I have had many comments of saying, yeah, this is only works in line of sight, but I, I want to get, rid, get this comment across here. It also works in non-line of sight environments as long as enough light. And enough light depends, we can use even low energy via our scaling mechanisms for that gamma. This is by design made line of sight so that I can show you do that. But if you have it in the ceiling, if you have different light sources, it would also work if your smartphone is underneath the chair. And I also get the question, what happens if you get ambient sunlight? I'm not able to hold the sun in my hand, but I have a high brightness LED headlight that produces constant light. Can I interfere it? I'm holding it directly into the hole where the receiver is. It really doesn't interfere with the transmission. So constant light doesn't really hurt us. So we can have the sun walking by the, the receiver or even it can make it flash. So it's really bright. Flash into the hole. Only if I do that, it stops. So, so we have developed that. We are at the, at the beginning of a startup company that will be in operation in January. And my dream is that every light bulb in the future will carry a little microchip with uh, our technology inside. And it's then not Intel in, inside, it's uh, VLC Limited inside. That, that's our, our future vision. And with that, I hope I have not exceeded the time too much. Thank you very much. join me in thanking Harold for, and I will, can't resist, the wonderfully illuminating talk that you <laughs> have given us today. And note that uh, I am head of college here, and I have to say, when I come to inaugural lectures like this, it makes me very proud to be a head of college. I feel like a, you know, a mother with all her children, and they're doing really well. And uh, Harold, you've, uh, you know, you have a hard act to follow, so, and we wish you all the best for the future. Keep thinking outside the box, please, for us all. And all of you, when you go home, remember you've got your homework. So you've been charged by the principal that you've got to build a radio <laughs> tonight. And you've been charged by Harold to go and buy one of these lights and uh, develop that yourself. So you're going to be busy. So don't spend too long here afterwards. And I expect you all at my office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning to show me the results of your uh, works overnight. But anyway. Thank, uh, please join me in thanking Harold for a wonderful talk here uh, this evening. It's been truly inspirational. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.